My name is Sarah Ladislaw. I direct the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. Thank you all so very much for being here today. Um, today is the first in a new series uh, that we're launching called Electricity and Transition. Uh, and about a year ago, we were taking a look around the electricity space and saying, geez, there's a lot of things happening, whether it's uh, sort of the amount of natural gas that we've got in this country sort of making its way into the electricity system, uh, a sort of active and, and uh, a, a robust sort of decarbonization agenda, um, ongoing concerns about cybersecurity, increased concerns about resiliency of the infrastructure, um, a whole host of things that we saw lots and lots of people doing really, really great work on, uh, but from specific vantage points, either from their sort of advocacy or, or sort of in, uh, particular interest uh, vantage point, uh, or just sort of dealing with one subsection uh, of these larger challenges. Uh, and so what we decided to do was, in the interest of uh, sort of furthering public education and having a robust dialogue about the electricity sector, was to launch a speaker series. Uh, and so today is sort of the introduction of that series, and uh, we are very, very pleased uh, to have with us uh, a great group of folks, including uh, Melanie Kinderdine, our keynote speaker, um, to talk about some of those issues. So we'll, we'll have a, a, a discussion about the Quadrennial Energy Review, uh, and then also uh, then a panel about some of the core tensions within the, the electricity sector. Uh, I'm not, I don't have the honor of, of being able to, to introduce Melanie today, um, but I do have uh, the, uh, the privilege to introduce Charlie Curtis. Uh, Charlie is, uh, is uh, a wonderful friend of CSIS, um, but also someone who's been involved in these issues for uh, a very long time from a wide variety of vantage points, whether it's at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission as Deputy Secretary of Energy uh, and uh, his various appointments on the Hill or at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Uh, Charlie's been doing all of this work for a very long time, and we're very pleased to announce uh, that he is a resident fellow here now uh, at CSIS and helping us to guide this work. So I'd like to invite Charlie up here to, uh, to introduce Melanie. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, we begin this project to look at what I call the most critical of our critical infrastructures and the Department of Energy's uh, quadrennial energy uh, review work. I say work because the QER is actually uh, under the supervision of uh, the president's science advisor and, OS and at the office of OSTP and the domestic uh, policy advisor in the White House. Um, the challenge of the QER, uh, which relies on the Department of Energy for the secretariat role, is that it must interact with named 22 agencies, I counted them, Melanie, and plus two regulatory commissions and quote, such other agencies as the president might decide. <laughs> Happily, we have uh, Me Melanie Kenderdine here, who's the director of the Office of Energy Policy and System Analysis. That's a new office that was created by Secretary Boniz to uh, provide a sharp focus on energy policy and a sharp focus on systems analysis, which is really kind of a unique thing for the Department of Energy to do and a very important and essential thing if the QER has any chance of success. Um, as uh, Sarah indicated, I've been, I counted it up, I've been engaged in the energy swamp for over 40 years now, and uh, have a great appreciation for how difficult energy policy is. We always refer to it as a derivative policy that derives from our, our security, our environmental, and our um, economic overarching goals. Uh, Today, energy is uh, providing uh, a increasingly important role in our economy in uh, fueling a rebirth of the industrial sector. Talk about uh, the United States as the largest combined oil and gas producer it was unheard of during the periods that I was walking the energy policy halls. 
So things are changing, and things are changing in the electric utility industry as well. Fortunately, Melody brings to this uh, um, task a wealth of experience. It's rich and deep. Her bio is in the materials that have been distributed to you. I just want to point out that she was the executive director or associate director at MIT's energy initiative that did a series of very well-respected uh, studies of the various fuels, present and future assessments. She spent seven years, I think, at GRI? Six. Six. And uh, she can, I assure you, spell both Adam and BTU which is unusual for a policy person at the Department of Energy, to tell you the truth. And it mirrors uh, her uh, boss, uh, Ernie Moniz, who I can say unqualifiedly is the most qualified secretary uh, that has ever served in that office. And I say that with the greatest respect to Jim Schlesinger, who, know, who knew much about security knew not much about Adams, but he did not have the depth of, because the department was new and he was coming to it new, the depth of experience that Ernie brings to this job in this challenging period. Probably Melanie's greatest uh, role, though, is she is the, capitalized the, energy counselor to the secretary. That puts her in a dominant policy position. Lastly, I want to say she's home alone. Uh, she came back from Rome yesterday. She's going to New York right after this speech. And uh, so anybody in this room that has any influence on the Senate of the United States, please urge them to move the nominees that have been sitting, I think there's six of them, sitting before nine, uh, sitting before the Senate. Uh, and I'm very serious about that. Unless people who know about the stakes involved here get on the Senate, this won't happen. So please do that. And with that, Melanie, thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. I, uh, as Charlie said, I just um, got back from the G7 Energy Ministerial in Rome uh, late last night, and uh, it was a very, I think, fruitful meeting. Uh, the, uh, the communique speaks about the need to act on collective energy security and, uh, and has a very broad definition of energy security, which is what we were very interested in seeing as we uh, went into the meeting. And, and I think uh, uh, the secretary certainly views this uh, as, as a success and a starting point to la launch a larger, uh, a larger effort on energy security with the Europeans and, um, and with the uh, G7 and J Japan and Canada. And, uh, and we're looking forward to the days ahead, working with them while we were there and, and going through the uh, various uh, elements in the communique and uh, in bilaterals with the ministers that we met with. Uh, uh, infrastructure figured very heavily into that, those conversations and meetings. And uh, at one point I said to the secretary that that uh, we needed a QER for Europe, and, um, and I'll say a little bit about why. I think there are only about three or four people in this room who have heard this talk before, and uh, so everyone else will laugh at the same jokes. I haven't had time to write any new ones. We've been flying around. And, uh, and also, I would say one that Charlie didn't read my, my education. I had a strong focus in Russian history. And because of Ukraine, I, for the first time in my professional life, have actually gotten to use my education. And uh, it's been great. Um, any rate, uh, the, um, the, uh, I, I'm going to skip over the, I had slides I took out on the presidential memorandum and how the QER came about. 
uh, the president put out a memorandum in, uh, on January 9th uh, directing us to do the Q, directing the federal government to do the QER. Uh, the Department of Energy is one of 22 agencies. I thought there were less than that. And uh, every time I hear about what we have to do, I feel like I don't have time to give a speech. And uh, there are 22 agencies. But DOE has a couple of special roles in that. One is we are the executive secretariat for the, managing that interagency process which is uh, very, very substantial. Uh, we right now are, are deeply uh, into that process of forming up teams within DOE and across the government on a range of issues. And so that was in the presidential memorandum. The president instructed us to uh, focus on energy infrastructure. And I'll tell you why with a focus on infrastructure in just a second. Um, I would say that the secretary, um, uh, then uh, the director of the energy, MIT Energy Initiative and a member of PCAST, uh, was on a PCAST group, that study group, that recommended a quadrennial energy review. And so, so he, as he says, was uh, there to throw the uh, baseball and then is now on the other side to catch it as well. And he's excited about actually be, being able to do something that he recommended in PCAST. And one thing before I go into why focus on infrastructure, I'm going to tell you, uh, as, as Charlie said, uh, the energy policy and systems analysis is a new office at DOE. Um, since I started in May, of last year, uh, we got the office up and running and are well deeply into the QER. But to tell you a little bit about how that office is organized, because you will understand um, from that organization how we are uh, looking at the QER. And I would mention one other thing. DOE is the executive secretariat, but it's also providing the analytical support for the QER. So we're doing a lot of the analysis, almost all of the analysis work right now. We will engage other agencies and, and, uh, and are doing so uh, right as we speak. But so we're responsible for pulling that analysis together. And so we have two unique functions within the federal government. Um, but we are one of many and, and, uh, and actually are quite excited about it. The um, why focus on infrastructure? And a lot of people have asked me, uh, uh, why did you start at infrastructure? Um, why didn't you start in the traditional uh, supply and demand uh, 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 mode, which we tend to do, um, and the uh, why we focused on infrastructure. You can look at it. Periods of sustained American economic development have been associated with major uh, infrastructure uh, uh, improvements and buildouts: canals, railroads, dams, and highways. Energy infrastructure plays an essential role in American prosperity and creates competitive advantage. The longevity and high costs of energy infrastructure mean that decisions made today will strongly influence our energy mix for much of the 21st century. Our vulnerabilities are increasing. I'll go into those in a minute. And uh, th this is, these are significant changes and we believe warrants federal policy. The analysis will tell us what policies. The, um, the uh, uh, QER is a four-year roadmap and this is where I'll tell you how we're organized to support this. Uh, year one, we are even narrowing it further from energy infrastructure to TS&D infrastructure, and that's transmission storage and distribution writ large. It's not only electricity. Uh, electricity will be one of the major work streams, um, but that's a, a broad definition. Um, the uh, uh, networks uh, deliver uh, these fuels, electricity, et cetera, to 300 million customers. These infrastructures tend to uh, set supply and demand patterns for, uh, for decades. And, um, and I'll, one thing about how we are organized, as I go into the infrastructures we're going to be looking at, um, I have, uh, I'm sure you know these people, many of you do, Judy Greenwald is the Deputy Director for um, uh, Climate Efficiency and Environment. Uh, Carmine DeFilio is the Deputy Director for Energy Security. Bill Hederman is the Deputy Director for Infrastructure Integration and, and Systems Analysis. So a lot of the modeling work is going to be done in Bill's, um, Bill's shop. Uh, Hugh Chen is doing energy finance. These infrastructures are in the, largely in the hands of the private sector, so finance, incentives, and budget are really important. Um, as we get further downstream in our analysis, that's going to rise in importance. And Karen Wayland is the Deputy Director for, um, for uh, 
uh, states, state, tribal, and local uh, governments. And we have a significant amount of uh, outreach, which I'll talk about in a minute as well. This slide is uh, one of several in here you can't read, but this is, you only need to pay attention to the uh, blue bars. Uh, as I said, we're gonna have a major, major work stream focus on electricity, um, a major work stream on oil and petroleum products, a major focus on natural gas uh, infrastructure, and then others, coal transport, biofuels, solar, wind, nuclear, and CO2, which we're still not certain whether we're going to uh, go deeply into CO2. Those are all, by and large, with the exception of biofuels, uh, electricity related. And so there are some specific issues related to those, uh, those infrastructures, but, certain, and, and, uh, but most of those are electricity uh, and will have an electricity focus. The, um, I'm gonna, this is how we're organizing our, um, our analysis. Uh, we've started out looking at limitations of the current uh, systems, and those limitations start with age. These are things that are baked into the existing systems that will be with us um, right now and for years to come because they're already there. Uh, the age, and you can see there over 50% of our gas transmission and gathering pipelines were built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, the pipeline that blew up in New York, uh, blew up the apartment buildings in New York City was over 100 years old. Um, I think you're going to find a lot more stories like that in the older cities in the East and Midwest. So age is a serious problem. Replacement of that, the cost of replacement of those, or just maintaining them and, and uh, uh, managing the degradation of those existing infrastructures is extremely costly. And then finally, the workforce. Um, I didn't anticipate that we were going to be uh, looking at workforce when I started this, but I have heard it everywhere I've gone that workforce is a serious issue. Um, just a factoid, over 60% of the workers in areas, uh, in, in electric and gas utility areas are expected to retire um, in the next decade. And so, and, and uh, I would note that when we were at MIT, um, we started an energy miner. The MIT Energy Initiative started an energy miner. We couldn't find an organizational home for it. We didn't want to put it in one department because energy is so cross-cutting and multidisciplinary. And so we ended up having to create a governance structure that we ran out of the MIT Energy Initiative. And, um, and it rapidly became one of the largest miners at MIT. Within a couple of years, it was one of the lar largest miners. And my son is graduating from MIT on June 6th, and he's working on an energy miner, uh, actually wants to be a petroleum engineer. I told him he would live in the worst places on the planet and uh, if he was doing that. And, but his, his, his major now is material science. His minor is Chinese, and he has visions of producing shale gas in China. And so uh, uh, it's pretty hard from what I hear. But um, so, so he took advantage of the energy miner. A lot of students have. It is very, very important that we, uh, we um, create the intellectual pipeline and infrastructure that we need for the next generation of technologies, and quite frankly, for o oil and gas. Um, another, the students that I worked with, uh, one of whom is sitting in the uh, audience here today, um, when they first started coming to me, I was there for six and a half years, and we had a symposium st series. They all wanted to work on renewables. My last two years there, to they, uh, they uh, wanted to work on natural gas. So there was a shift in interest. You could see it. It's, a, it's just a hugely important issue. So those are the limitations of the current system, um, and we are, we are doing baseline work to look at those limitations for the range of infrastructures that I showed you on the previous slide. We're also looking at some near and long-term infrastructure vulnerabilities that are, are growing. Um, climate change, uh, you can see them coming up there faster than I thought. Um, climate change, uh, uh, we did a, a uh, I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute. I have another slide. You saw a whole lot about that uh, in the last couple of days with the climate change uh, report that was rolled out. And uh, it is, climate change is a, has serious impacts on our, our energy infrastructures. We need to be mindful of that. Um, Cybersecurity. Uh, you can go to the Department of Homeland Security's web page and homepage, and what you see there is 53% of all cyber attacks 
um, between October and May of 2013. Those were on energy installations. You look at that pie chart. The next highest uh, percentage is a low, low single digit number, and all the rest are in single digits. So cybersecurity in energy installations are a huge um, target of attack for cyber. When I started at DOE, I don't, were you, are you my, I don't think you were there. Yeah, you were the undersecretary then, yeah. Uh, when I started at DOE in 1993, we didn't have email. I think we got email in like 1994. And, um, and so, uh, and I refused to do Google searches for a long time. And, and, uh, and, uh, but now, and cybersecurity was not even thought of at that time. And now it's a very, very serious and growing problem. Physical threats, I know you all have read about this on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and, uh, but uh, we had three highly visible attacks on uh, electric substations uh, in the, um, uh, uh, last year, one of the I mean one of those was extremely sophisticated. It was not uh, drunken uh, a young men driving around in a pickup truck shooting things up. It was a very sophisticated attack, and so we are very uh, concerned and working with the industry on physical threats, interdependencies. The interdependencies of the electric and gas systems is growing. You all are very familiar with that. Um, but in Hurricane Sandy, we saw uh, significant, significant interdependencies between uh, the electric infrastructure and the fueling infrastructure. We had some fuel in the region, but we couldn't get the gas pumps to work. And so there were shortages of, of gasoline in, in the region. Um, so we're, there are a lot of interdependencies. I'll say a little bit more about some new ones that I didn't anticipate in 1994 either. Uh, I'll say more in a minute. And then supply and demand shifts. Um, the Marcellus and the Bakken are uh, very obvious examples of those supply and demand shifts. But we are, are seeing incredible congestion in some of our infrastructures because of those supply-demand shifts. Hold on, go back. These are the uh, uh, climatic events that I referred to a minute ago and the uh, impacts on our energy infrastructures. My office put out a, a study on this in July. Um, uh, what you're seeing is lower water levels. That is affecting the availability of hydropower. Um, wildfires, uh, Jerry Brown had to declare an emergency in, Cal in San Francisco because wildfires were threatening the transmission lines 150 miles away. Um, so it's having serious, uh, uh, there are serious concerns with that. Um, flooding is having impacts on inland power plants. Water restrictions are limiting uh, shale gas and power production. We've seen a little bit of that recently. Uh, lower river, river levels are affecting barge traffic, uh, which is a uh, growing uh, 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 infrastructure that we need to uh, deliver um, uh, oil. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, intense storms, Hurricane Sandy was certainly that, the polar vortex. Um, I uh, spent several weeks of my life this year working on the propane crisis in the upper Midwest. And then cooling water intake or, or discharge is too hot. Those are just a few of the examples. Um, we also are going to have a significant regional focus in the Quadrennial Energy Review. Um, uh, this is hard to read too, but the, the, uh, these are electric generation capacity under construction. Uh, in two, 2012, and the uh, bars are regions of the country. Um, the, the big bar there on the far left is California, and the blue, it almost looks purple here, but the blue at the bottom is natural gas, and what you see is across the regions of the country is significant uh, natural gas ad, uh, capacity additions. The green on that California bar is solar. So a lot of solar capacity additions. Uh, the little green bar right next to that, that's the Southwest. Uh, that's where the resource that they have. So you're seeing a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, solar added in those areas. The red bars in the middle and to the right, that is nuclear. And those um, additions are, capacity additions are exclusively in the Southeast. So, so there is a lot of infrastructure associated with these capacity additions. It just demonstrates the enormous regional differences that we have. And, and the secretary is very, very uh, uh, firm on this and interested in this. And, and one reason why he has 
focused us on energy infrastructure as opposed to a broader comprehensive um, energy plan is that he would like these to be actionable recommendations. Um, the narrower the focus, the more actionable they will be. And he is very, very cognizant of the regional differences and thinks that if we take those into account, we will uh, have a much better product in the end. This is uh, another one that's impossible to read, but it's a very illustrative of um, what we are seeing. I mentioned the congestion uh, a minute ago. The far left, uh, upper left, is these, this is from the EIS for the Keystone Pipeline from the State Department. The upper left is uh, in 2010, and those red dots are the oil onloading uh, facilities onto trains. There were six of them. The map in the far lower right is in 2013. 2013. It is three years later. And what you see are over 50 red dots. Um, so, and it looks like when you look at that map, it looks like the work around of the Keystone Pipeline. I mean, that's fundamentally what it is, moving Bakken oil uh, down to the Gulf of Mexico. And, and you also, you can't see them, but there are little uh, uh, green uh, triangles on there that is our barges that are now moving oil down to the Gulf of Mexico as well. And you, so you're seeing significant congestion in the Gulf of Mexico because of the change in where we are producing our, uh, our oil, but not a change in where we are refining our oil or where we are shipping uh, oil products out of the country. And so um, we, I'm sure most of you know that we announced, a we did a test sale of SPR oil about six weeks ago. We did it for precisely this reason. Reason is because we need to be able to determine whether with all of this congestion, the SPR can still work as it is envisioned to work. And uh, I don't know the results of that. I know all of the oil will be moved out and paid for by June 20th. And, um, and so, uh, and, and we will do an analysis afterwards. But there is enormous congestion in that area. And one of the pipelines uh, uh, feeding out of the uh, SPR has reversed flows, one of the major pipelines. So, so it's a, a significant change. And this is one of the many things that we are looking at. Um, I did testify uh, last week before Senate Energy on the propane crisis, and propane is competing for rail with ethanol, grain, fertilizer, oil, et cetera, et cetera. So the train, uh, the rail, rail system is being asked to do a lot of things, and there are a lot of competing commodities that are going on to those, uh, those cars, and we're going to be looking at that. Um, this is another astounding uh, uh, slide that illustrates, again, that kind of congestion. Uh, in 2005, there were 6,100 rail cars transporting oil, and in 2013, there were 425,000. And that's, I, I can guarantee you that between 2013 and now, it's gone up even higher. It's, it's just a, a something, again, I didn't anticipate looking at workforce. I didn't anticipate looking at rail as an infrastructure that we needed to care about, and, and it's a very serious concern. Um, this is a, a, our, our uh, analytical approach. I mentioned the limitations and the vulnerabilities. We have some national energy goals there, economic competitiveness, environmental responsibility, and energy security. Those are pretty um, a standard there in a lot of speeches that I've given for many, many years. I took this slide up. I was meeting in Ottawa with the Canadian government, and they asked me if they could use this because their goals were exactly the same. And, um, and, but the, it, it, there's a good reason why we always use them, they're important. But we have uh, taken it a little bit beyond that, and we are looking at desirable characteristics. We're looking at desirable characteristics um, for our energy infrastructures in 2030. We picked 2030 because, and this, this is a true story, Adam Semensky was uh, uh, doing a speech one day. I went into his office, and he had his uh, paper slides all put out on the table is in uh, his, his, uh, his version of slide sorter. And there were two slides. Um, the, uh, the first was, uh, uh, and they were both of China. China's CO2 emissions uh, drop off in starting in 2030. And China's iron production drops off dramatically in 2030. And I asked him, what was that about? And he said, because they have stopped 
they've fundamentally built out their infrastructures and they will be transitioning to a service economy in 2030. So I pick the date 2030 as kind of the time frame you want to go head to head with the Chinese or anyone competing in a global service economy who has first or second generation energy infrastructures when ours is third and fourth and fifth. Um, you want to go head to head uh, and compete with them. You need to think about modernizing or transforming your infrastructures over that period of time. So these are our uh, desirable characteristics. They would be uh, apply to some infrastructures, not all, and in very varying degrees of importance for the various infrastructures that we're looking at. But you want an, a minimal environmental footprint. Uh, you want robustness, and within robustness, um, and it's defined there, uh, we have reliability and resiliency as two uh, different characteristics. We had a uh, technical workshop last week on developing resiliency network, uh, metrics. It is the buzzword of the day is resiliency. Um, we couldn't find good definitions and good metrics for it. Uh, we are working on putting those together. Um, and uh, then we want uh, flexibility in our infrastructures. Um, and there are sub-characteristics of that of extensibility, interoperability, and uh, optionality. Um, I don't have my glasses on. The last one's hard to read. And, and from that slide, and the next one, scalability, and the next one, affordability, you can see why they call that, we call them our illities. Um, they are almost all illities. And uh, uh, we, we did have environmental responsibility, and somebody took that out. Uh, but these are, by and large, engineering terms uh, from, not surprisingly, an MIT engineering paper. Uh, they were readily defined, and, and these are big infrastructure engineering challenges, and they seemed appropriate for what we're looking for. So we are in the process of developing metrics for the various infrastructures we are looking at based on these characteristics. The, um, the analytical approach, uh, I don't want to go into this. We, 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 we have policy goals and, and characteristics that, that, uh, that I've described for you. Uh, we've gone through and we've developed a whole set series of baselines. Um, we've done physical baselines for electricity, gas, and oil and petroleum products. Um, we, are, uh, we have also done baselines of a sort for uh, federal, uh, federal and state law and regulation as they apply to those three different sets of infrastructure because they're all, we're all, all very different. And we've done a financial baseline where we are, um, we are looking at the range of tools that we have to incentivize the private sector if the analysis uh, uh, suggests that we need that when we get done with it. So, um, so uh, we are deep into the... Um, the uh, QER baseline systems and scenario analyses. Uh, these are the uh, candidate scenarios. I'll just go down to the uh, third green bullet. Um, we're looking at a range of technology scenarios. One obviously will be aggressive carbon. Uh, another is greater uh, 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 direct consumer control of, of energy, and that's uh, gonna have a, obviously a distributed generation focus. Um, low-cost deployment of renewable energy technologies. We're going to pick a, a, a scenario where uh, you do indeed have very low-cost renewables and see what that does to the system. Um, uh, low uh, new nuclear, uh, low cost for new nuclear. Uh, and what does it mean if we lose a significant load, if we, uh, if we uh, retire significant plants? What does that mean for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, for example? Uh, low cost natural gas, which I think we can probably say is a fair thing for the next 15 years or so, um, according to EIA and then a widespread deployment of CCS. So those are our kind of uh, our scenario analysis once we do the baseline analysis, which we are deeply into now, um, and then we will do systems analysis and, uh, and then these, this scenario analysis, so three products. Um, I mentioned interdependencies uh, before. Uh, we are going to be looking at uh, a range of interdependencies, natural gas and electricity, electricity and gasoline. Uh, oil and natural gas. Um, you're seeing a lot of that uh, uh, changes in uh, uh, the propane market, for example. Used to be mostly oil, now it's mostly natural gas. 70%, um, I believe. Uh, water and thermal generation, water, to, water and energy transportation. 
Uh, something like barge traffic would definitely be affected by uh, by uh, water and and uh, energy and communication systems, and then as I mentioned, rail transport uh, there below. Um, a little focus on electricity. Uh, these are challenges and op opportunities for electricity infrastructures and how we're going to be looking at electricity. This is coming out of our electricity baseline, uh, looking at the role of transmission and the wholesale market in meeting greenhouse gas objectives, uh, changing paradigms and metrics for uh, planning for resilience. That's the, the uh, technical uh, workshop we had last week, uh, physical and cyber uh, threats. Um, the cyber threats are certainly more serious for, uh, for electricity than, than gas or oil. That's not to minimize the oil and gas uh, 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 concerns there, but uh, it's certainly the biggest concern is electricity. Uh, utility, the utility business model, we're seeing a lot of challenges to that business model now. I'm sure you all are familiar with that. And then the transactive customer role and what that means for uh, interoperability. And this is just a little on that customer role. Um, as you all know, customers are increasingly active participants in power system operation uh, because of distributed generation. We've been having uh, uh, a lot of meetings at the department on how to deal with rooftop solar, what that means for, for, uh, for base load power and for the utility business model, quite frankly. Um, uh, potential uh, and, and impediments for responsive load and the impact of transactive customer role on the utility business model. This is our outreach and schedule. Um, we're already behind. Um, phase one, the preliminary work, we, we, we're, we were on schedule for that. Um, we have two different phases of, um, of uh, uh, analysis. Um, as I mentioned, the, the uh, a baseline analysis that we're working on now and starting to get into the system analysis. And then uh, the second six-month period, and there is overlap, it's not all the same teams, uh, we'll be doing policy analysis engagement. And then finally, and I think that this is the least realistic, um, the least realistic, getting something through interagency in two months. And, um, and uh, I can hear, I, I, we're, it's just due on January 31st, 2015. And, uh, and uh, December 1st, I will have this off my plate and into, uh, into a very smooth, coordinated, uh, uh, right, a non-hysterical process. And, and, uh, but we will uh, we will uh, uh, we'll make our deadline. Oh, well, I say that not so confidently, but it's it's a lot of work to do, as you can tell. Uh, these are agency stake the, the QER stakeholders in the middle is is uh, Domestic Policy Council and OSTP. They are chairing the task force within DOE. Our stakeholders are the national labs and CAB and PCAST. Where P some PCAST members are also members of the Secretary of Energy's advisory board, and so they're giving some some uh, overlap and and good advice to both organizations um, and our energy and science programs. Uh, the external stakeholders, this is an old slide. Um, the usual suspects, but I, I know it's an old slide because I do need to add uh, Canada and Mexico. Uh, we, uh, we are going to look at North American uh, infrastructures. We have to, three out of eight of our reliability regions uh, uh, depend on su substantial imports and exports of electricity from Canada, for example. That's why I was in Ottawa a couple weeks ago. Uh, and they are very, very interested in this and, um, and didn't ask me about the Keystone Pipeline. Um, uh, it was the first, they knew they couldn't, they couldn't get an answer, um, but it's the, the, one of the few, don't ask me about that today, I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer. But the, um, the, uh, if you don't, it will be the first public talk that I've given where I haven't been asked about it. And, um, and uh, so that's, that's how we're, that's our universe right now which is pretty broad, and we're getting input, getting, uh, uh, going out and seeking their advice and getting uh, inputs from them. Uh, we spent uh, 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 45 minutes in my office one day uh, trying to figure out something having to do with automobiles and having no idea what we were talking about, and I finally said, you know, I bet the Department of Transportation has that information, so we will be relying on, on the, uh, the other agencies for a lot of work. And, and, uh, and, and a lot of work that they've already done. And as I said, we're going through that outreach right now. 
Uh, I, I always have to have two illegible slides. Um, this one you can't read either, but these are the public planned events that we are having across the country. Uh, we had our first uh, stakeholder um, uh, meeting in Washington. Uh, that, that meeting focused on the vulnerabilities of our infrastructures. I think it was very well attended. Uh, we had it in the Capitol building. We then had our first two of 15 regional outreach meetings. Uh, Secretary Moniz went to both. Those were in New England. Uh, obviously, uh, New England is a very, very infrastructure constrained region. They've had a lot of problems for that. We went to Hartford and uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and I'll just read them for you uh, because you can't read them. Um, infrastructure constraints, uh, we're gonna do that in North Dakota. That'll focus on the Bakken that I talked about a minute ago. Petroleum products uh, and transmission and distribution, that is scheduled for May 27th. Um, uh, Electricity West, will be doing that in Portland, Oregon. Uh, rail barge and truck transportation in Chicago, Illinois. Um, Electricity East will probably go to New Jersey. We haven't scheduled dates for most of the remainder. Um, finance and incentives um, and market incentives in New York. Natural gas, T&D, Pittsburgh, PA for obvious reasons. Uh, state, local, and tribal issues in New Mexico. Gas, electricity, interdependence, um, probably do that in Colorado. Uh, they've done a lot of work on that in Colorado. Um, some very interesting studies about what happened with their uh, renewable portfolio standard uh, in, in Colorado, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and then infrastructure siting in Wyoming, rural electricity issues in Iowa, business and economic development. We'll look at jobs that too in Atlanta and then wrap up again in Washington. And uh, just staffing these is a major, uh, major uh, job, and that's what Karen Moyland is doing. Anyway, the, uh, as Charlie said, uh, when he was at the uh, Department of Energy, uh, and we were, we were, we were there uh, together for a long time together, and uh, I was there for most of the eight years of the Clinton administration, have come back. Uh, the Secretary, or Secretary Moniz calls us recidivists, and we have um, come back to the Department of Energy and the energy space is nothing like it was when I left the government before. And the, uh, the oil and gas fortunes of the United States have changed very, very dramatically. Um, it has enormous implications uh, for our competitiveness, uh, for our trade deficit, for the climate, and, and for our energy infrastructures. And things are changing as we speak. This will be a tough one to write because, because things are changing constantly in that energy space. And, um, uh, but we're looking forward to it and I look forward to questions. Thank you. A moderator usually starts out by asking a couple questions, but uh, I don't think that's necessary with this audience, so I, I will pass that opportunity. Uh, we have microphones uh, around, so if you um, stand to have a question, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Wait for the microphone, please, and try to uh, put your uh, comments in the form of a question. Uh, so uh, it's novel, I know, but it's important. You know, it, Melanie is actually, this is very close to her one year anniversary mm -hmm. of her return to the Department of Energy. The secretaries do. And the secretaries, and it's reminiscent of Samuel Johnson's uh, admonition that it's uh, on second marriages, that it was a triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> I'm going to have to use that. So. <laughs> Questions? Sorry. In the middle, please. Uh, thank you, Melanie. I'm John Shaga, Strategic Petroleum Consulting. Uh, some of us are getting concerned about the amount of natural gas that's being flared in the Bakken and in the Eagleford. Will the QER address moving that gas? Uh, actually, yes, we will be looking at methane emissions, and um, and that will be a focus. 
we have a corresponding, my office doesn't just do the QER. We have a lot of other responsibilities, and one of them has been the methane strategy development for, um, for uh, as part of the clim climate action plan that the president put out last June. And, and uh, so we, we will be folding some of that into the QER and we'll uh, focus on flaring in the Bakken. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. The, uh, I think that uh, uh, Administrator McCarthy, while I was in Rome, said that we wouldn't be, they weren't planning on regulatory action on methane emissions. Uh, we are, we are, DOE right now in the Climate Action Plan is focused on mid and downstream emissions. EPA is focused on upstream emissions. So, so in that plan, uh, that is their focus. But we will uh, uh, certainly address it and figure out uh, what precisely can be done. Uh, we also, John, we're, um, this is, we're doing an update of the quadrennial technology review. That's an internal DOE document. I'm sure that they will be looking at technologies for uh, methane emissions reductions as well. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Jose Colucci. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, one month ago, I went to a presentation from uh, Germany that where they mentioned where they're going uh, for the year, I think, 2050, their whole portfolio of energy. And typically, they, they start with the pie chart of, well, this is where we're going to go, and this is the infrastructure that we need. Do you have that pie chart? I mean, like, I, I know that you were mentioning all the infrastructure work that has to be done, but wh wh where are we going? I mean, where is the expectations of what is going to be the mix for that 2030? We, we um, in, in our scenario analysis, we're looking at, we're using uh, EIA's AEO 2014 as their, their reference case as a base. So, so they, we will have those kinds of forecasts that will inform where we're going, and to some degree, that's not to say that we wouldn't, uh, we, we're certainly modeling policy changes and, and different scenarios, which are fundamentally the one slide I showed you with the, uh, the range of scenarios we're going to be looking at. Those are really just variations in the cost of technologies. And, um, and so, but we will be using the AEO 2014 as our baseline. John Holmes, National Research Council. Um, so you talked about year one, and infrastructure seems to hit a lot of the areas. Where do you go for year two, three, and four? Yeah, I, I realized I forgot to, uh, to go through my entire slide, because I couldn't really, I don't have my glasses on, I couldn't really <laughs> read it very well. Um, and so I just skipped over that part. The, the um, year two, this is White House directed, so obviously the White House will determine where we go in year two. We have talked to them. Probably next year we will do uh, a supply and end use infrastructures, keeping the focus on infrastructures, but doing kind of the uh, 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 typical uh, uh, where you would tend to start in most analyses like this. Um, so I think that that will likely be where we go. Year three, and this is just the world according to me, I've had no discussions with the Secretary or the White House on this. I would like to look at energy supply chains, and, and which I think is a very different way to look at energy, and, and I think it's an important, would, my, would most likely bring some important insights to uh, how we think about energy. What made me start thinking about, <clears throat> excuse me, supply chains, was um, the uh, Metcalf incident, and where where we don't have the transformers are all customized, and fundamentally take 18 months to build a custom transformer, and and uh, I think that that's something that we really really need to focus some of our attention on. Another big issue on supply chains is critical materials. Very important for the future of renewable technologies, but 97% of those are produced in China. And so, so just a couple of examples is why I think if we could pick some, some really uh, uh, serious uh, uh, supply chain issues to look at, I think would provide some insights. And then in year four, we will surely do a wrap up. Um, I didn't mention either that we have changed the definition of quadrennial. 
Um, typically, when you uh, when you uh, uh, the quadrennial defense review is once every four years. We're doing installments and we'll do the wrap up in year four. And, uh, but that's so that we can take uh, two, two reasons. The quadrennial defense review is an internally focused strategic document that informs the Department of Defense's budget. The Department of Energy doesn't own the energy uh, sector. Um, by and large, we have the the uh, the power marketing administrations. Um, nor do we control the regulations or the laws, and so or or and, and our budget d doesn't have a whole lot to do with how we might want to change our infrastructures or modernize our infrastructures. So so our quadrennial review is very very different than what you see at the Defense Department, and we want to make it actionable. And the energy space is huge, which why is why we're taking the smaller chunks. So, so infrastructure will be the common theme at some point through. Not necessarily, but but I mean we can look at supply and demand. If we look at it next year and the White House decides to go in that direction, that's fundamentally an infrastructure question as well. So last question. Melanie has a very hard stop and uh, so I uh, one sir. Mark Breifogel, um, I'm with on log and distributed generation. I developed distributed generation equipment. Yeah, kind of a broad question. One hears about peak oil, peak gold, whatnot. One hears about peak finance as well. Yeah. Growth of the economy is very arguable. I think we were less than 1%. Was it one-tenth of 1%? I think manufacturing still is going overseas. If I'm incorrect, electric demand is flat or down. Um, you're familiar with the duck curve in California? No. Do you see? Uh, the peak demand is maybe at five in the afternoon and all the renewables yeah, are yeah, available yeah. in the early afternoon yeah. and the, you need to keep a lot of old thermal infrastructure if you will to keep right. it going. But having looked at all of this, I don't see a big demand for electricity growing, but I see huge manufacturing costs and I see the banks either not being willing or enable just the shortage of funds to build out the infrastructure. And I don't see a clear economic case. I don't see one year paybacks, I see 10 year paybacks. So comment on that, please. Um, Who's gonna pay for it? Well, that, as I said, we have a, uh, a uh, deputy director who's focused on finance incentives and budget. And uh, the, uh, this is in the hands of the private sector, and ultimately the, those will largely be private sector decisions. But I, I, I would take exception to a couple of things you made in your statement. Uh, manufacturing is growing. In the United States, 100, $150 billion uh, has moved back into the United States um, and uh, uh, from manufacturing, and that is, by and large, because of inexpensive natural gas. And so, so that's what it is attributed to. And, and flat electricity demand doesn't mean we can't grow. It means that we are more, it could very well mean that our, our economy is more productive and more efficient. So, so I'm not sure that all of the things you illustrated, uh, used to illustrate some dire things are necessarily the case. Um, but one of the things that the QER will be looking at is how do you incent how, new utility business models and how to incentivize the uh, build out and modernization of infrastructure uh, uh, based on the, uh, the analysis and data that we, uh, that we do and data that we have. And, and uh, we will go where the analysis takes us. So. Uh, the only thing I noticed in the uh, plan that you laid out uh, was that it didn't provide for hospital stays. And so I, need uh, that. I think you should think about that. <laughs> uh, what, what kind of hospital, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> let, uh, let us all thank Melanie. She has a tremendous <laughs> job ahead of her.
Okay, so one of the reasons why we had sort of invited Melanie to come in and talk about the QER process was that when we were starting to think about the project we were undertaking, we thought, gee, we're taking on a lot of topics and it's pretty overwhelming. Uh, let's bring in someone who's actually being way more ambitious than us and make ourselves look reasonable. Um, it, it certainly is a, a huge amount of, uh, of undertaking that, uh, that the Department of Energy um, uh, is is uh, taking on in pursuing the quadrennial energy review process. But one of the core questions that we have about sort of not only that process, but the challenges facing the sector in general is um, it is, all, as we all sort of, everyone working in the energy sector knows, it's all very well and good to sort of study these issues and find the right academic questions uh, or solutions. It is quite another thing to actually enact them. Right, and so energy policy devoid of viewpoints or core tensions is uh, no energy policy that I've ever seen. Uh, and so one of the things that we wanted to do to sort of frame the way that we're trying to approach the rest of the series and what we're looking at as far as electricity, uh, uh, electricity and transition, or the the question about a an electricity sector. Uh, and whether it is in fact in a transition that is new and or different um, from where it has been before is what are some of the varying perspectives uh, in the people who invest in, consume, or produce, or are somehow responsible for the electricity sector that we have uh, today. And so to frame that discussion, we went out and talked to a whole host of people. Uh, and we picked four uh, of the, uh, the most interesting people that we had talked to uh, along uh, the lines of what we were exploring to talk specifically about what those core tensions are uh, in the decision-making process that we've got to go through about some of these issues, these illities, these uh, transitions that Melanie uh, uh, so expertly sort of put forward uh, uh, just a minute ago. And so today, we're very happy to have each of them here. Um, we've got Greg Aliff, uh, who's the Vice Chairman and Senior Partner for Energy Resources uh, at Deloitte. And we've asked Greg to sort of take on the consumer perspective uh, and the core tension of uh, managing the issues of affordability uh, and uh, low cost, but also increasing consumer choice uh, among sort of a broad range of consumers. Um, we also have uh, uh, next to him Christy Tizak, uh, who's a, uh, excuse me, a managing director at Clearview Energy Partners, and we asked Christy to talk sort of the challenge to talk about the challenges in the utility industry uh, of utility industry participants, uh, and particularly the competing priorities of selling electricity and, and reducing consumption, and what that sort of business model is uh, and uh, and means. Um, next, we've got Miles Keough, who's the Director of Grants and Research at uh, the National Association of the Regulatory Utility Commissioners. Uh, and we asked Miles to talk about the regulator perspective, uh, in particular, um, how to deal with some of the competing priorities that regulators are dealing with uh, in sort of managing uh, uh, some of these uh, managing some of these shifts. And then finally, John Larson, uh, who's a senior analyst at the Rhodium Group and actually was uh, just over at the Department of Energy uh, not too long ago, to talk a little bit about the sort of competing priorities of the decarbonization, low carbon energy agenda uh, with reliability and affordability, right? These are not in any way, shape, or form the definitive or conclusive perspectives on these issues, um, but it's certainly what we hope is a way of sort of getting to uh, some questions about um, how you manage the interests that are driving those competing tensions and how uh, we might sort of frame some of our thinking around those issues. So I, I think uh, maybe we could start with uh, Greg and then uh, just sort of come down the line this way. Each one will sort of deliver about 10 minutes of comments and then we'll have a little uh, period of discussion. So Greg, did you want to start? Well, thank, thank you, Sarah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to share a few perspectives with you on the, as Sarah said, on the on the issue of um, affordability of electricity uh, to to customers, and what may be that kind of the competing goal of customer choice. Um, I'm going to focus on maybe four areas. First of all, I'm going to uh, provide a few observations about what I call the changing face of the electricity customer. And when I say customer, I'm thinking both in terms of con of individual consumers and and also businesses. Uh, consuming electricity. Uh, some, of, um, some of the implications that this, I'll call it this changing face, has for electricity prices. Um, I'll chat about that for a moment. Um, and then some of the longer term uh, implications uh, that may be out there as a result of this. Um, so let me start with the changing face of, of, the, uh, of the customer. 
Uh, I've had the good privilege over the past four years to be involved in a study that we have conducted. We call it the resources study. We've done it uh, four years in a row, and it's allowed us to basically track um, the, be the, the attitudes and behaviors of individual consumers and businesses uh, toward electricity, toward choice, et cetera. Um, and I'll just kind of highlight for you a couple things that came out of the, the most recent study that is actually hasn't, uh, actually will not be published until this June uh, when the report will come out. Well, let me first turn to, to, um, to businesses. Um, what we found over the years is that the businesses are increasingly paying more and more attention um, to uh, their use of all natural resources, uh, not just electricity, but electricity, natural gas, uh, their transport fleets, et cetera. Um, and they are consistently becoming more sophisticated uh, and more mature in the way they're going about managing energy in their organizations. Uh, we're seeing them go much from what I would call a very siloed approach uh, where different pieces of the organization would be doing what they thought was the most appropriate thing to do around uh, managing energy consumption to one that's much more holistic, much more driven by overall corporate strategy, et cetera. Um, what's interesting is that there, it's, along with this maturity is the, is the goals that uh, businesses um, tend to seem to have. Their goals are quite aggressive. Uh, and, you know, on average, this is what we found, is that they are, their goals are to reduce their consumption somewhere in the range of the uh, low 20 percentage over approximately a three and a half year period. And if you step back and think about that, if they just achieve 50 percent of that goal, that's still a substantial reduction uh, in electricity consumption uh, in their business. Um, but we've seen this last year and the, the, the la the, this most recent year that we've done the study of two very interesting things. One of those is that, is that the length of time that they are expecting to achieve their goals um, are being lengthened. They're actually going a little bit longer. Uh, the reason for that is because the things that they're doing are more complex and involve spending more money uh, than they have previously. Um, the second thing that we noticed is that while the level of on-site generation was hovering right around 23, 24 percent among businesses. That now they're reporting that they're up to 40, over 40 percent of businesses report they have some form of on-site generation for a portion of their electricity uh, for a variety of a variety of reasons. Interestingly, the uh, industry sector that is um, uh, leads in that regard is the telecommunications and technology sector. So let me switch quickly to consumers. Um, well, we've, we, we, the first year we did this study, we were in the, right in the midst of the throes of the recession. Um, and what we saw were what I would call a very panicked consumer. They were looking to save money in just about anything they could do, and that included any ways they could use, reduce their electricity consumption and re reduce their electricity bill. As we moved out of the recession, we wanted to see how customers' views, uh, consumers' views changed. What's been very interesting is we have labeled the, the consumer the resourceful consumer because it is overwhelming that consumers have no intention of going back and actually to the consumption levels that they previously had. And in fact, they are looking to continue to reduce. Now, they've done the easy things, uh, which are uh, turning off lights, uh, turning off electronics when they're not being used, turning the thermostat up, you know, down and up to reduce the amount of, um, of electricity they're using. Um, what we saw in this most recent study is interesting. Uh, consumers are, in general, feeling better about their economic situation overall than they have previously. And one of the things that is a result of that is that they're actually starting to consider other act actions that they can take beyond the simple things. They're starting to look at things such as insulation, windows, and other things as being something that they plan to do, if they haven't already done it, that they plan to do in the, in the future as a ways to continue to be more energy efficient. So what is all this? That's, that's what we're seeing you know, across, the, across the U.S. Um, and so cust customers want choice. They want, they want the opportunity to be more efficient. Uh, they want the opportunity for solar on their roofs. Um, that's moved forward uh, quite a bit. 
Um, but I think the thing that you have to step back and focus on is, you know, the implications of, of these changes that are, that are taking place because, you know, all said and done, they don't come without um, a level of cost uh, with, with customer choice. And I know we've all seen lots of numbers out there, and the numbers I'm going to give you here just to put things, I think, in the magnitude of perspective, they just came out from the uh, EIA uh, in April as to the total system cost uh, on a dollars per megawatt hour of the various sources. On the low end is advanced combined cycle natural gas today at $64.40. And on the high end is solar PV at $130. Now we all know that that difference is shrinking. We all know that we're getting better at solar uh, than we've been. And we've got, you've got um, conventional wind in here at $80.30. So we know that, these, we know that, the, the, that it's shrinking, the renewables, the cost differential. But, but be that as it may, that differential is, is, is still there today. And, uh, and we still are dealing with it when we look at customer choice um, and the fact that electricity prices um, would, are, you know, in all probability, you know, associated with this will have to go up. I, I also just want to briefly point out, you know, maybe some of the, of, the, um, of the broader implications that I think of this, and it, it's interesting, comes back to, I was very interested to uh, hear Melanie's remarks and the focus um, on infrastructure. Um, and that is, with what we are seeing with customers and customers' choice and so forth, um, as electricity prices r rise, um, the customers have the, opportun customers have the opportunity to do additional things, to be even more efficient in how they use electricity uh, over time. Uh, things that weren't economic before, such as insulation and windows, become more economic as, as the cost of electricity goes up to consumers, for example. And so what we see over time, and we're starting to see it in a number of states with the, with the issues that are out there today around net metering, is this uh, inconsistency between, the, the, between the, the cost associated with the use of the grid among customers that are fully on the grid and customers that are, are, that are not fully on the grid. And, you know, I have, I have no doubt that this issue of net metering is one that will be addressed, and, you know, over, t over time. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an indication um, as we move more to things such as distributed generation um, and so forth, it starts to raise serious questions about the, the existing uh, central power plant transmission line infrastructure uh, that we have in the United States. Uh, forecasts are that on that traditional infrastructure, largely associated with reliability, uh, strengthening of the system, et cetera, um, that uh, over the next uh, two to four years, we'll, we'll be investing 90, approximately $90 billion a year in the system. And that is largely for reliability uh, purposes. So you can see we're putting tremendous amount of dollars into a system that is absolutely necessary to do for the, for the reasons that Melanie cited for reliability, resilience, et cetera. And yet we may be putting dollars into a system that's going to be used less and less over time if we indeed move more to a decentralized, more customer choice environment. So those are my, my comments to share, Sarah. Thanks, Greg. Maybe if we could move on to Christy and, and talk a little bit about sort of, you know, those same sort of issues, but from a utility industry player's perspective. There you go. The baton has been passed. Um, thank you, Michelle, for uh, including me here. Um, one of the things that I'd like to talk through a little bit, and, and for those of you who I know well in this room, um, forgive me, I know you're here and, and this discussion is intended to be for some of us who don't live and breathe all of this all the time. And I wanted to sort of lay out some of the components of electricity delivery that I think it lost in the conversation because um, it's interesting to me that utilities can be vilified um, to the extent they are in what Charlie refers to as um, stakeholder positions that never seem to change or evolve, and we all get sort of entrenched in the rhetoric here in policy circles in Washington. And I think a little um, discussion of where we are and how we got here um, is important. Power delivery has three components. We generate it, we transmit it over high voltage power lines, and we distribute it through our neighborhoods. And it 
shows up, God willing, at our houses most days. Um, when you look at what it costs to provide power to a customer, about 70% of it is in generation. And these are averages. You may argue with me about specific distributions, okay, but I'm trying to make a point here. 10% accounts for the transmission system, and 20% accounts for those wires that invariably seem to take a hiatus whenever the weather is bad. And I wanted to briefly discuss um, or provide, from my perspective, an answer to the question posed earlier as to who pays for this system, we all do. You do, I do, everybody who consumes power in this room, even if they're in a non-meter department, pays for it. We pay for it. So the question is, is what do we want and what will we eventually agree on? Generation is provided in a variety of ways, either through long-lived assets that the utilities own or through power purchase agreements from others or through various um, mechanisms, including increasingly storage or distributed providers. But each kilowatt um, in many, many service territories still is paid for by the customer on an average system kilowatt basis. In many cases, this was easy and efficient, but it results in the kilowatt that is consumed when it's 90 degrees in Washington being worth the same amount as the kilowatt that is produced in September overnight when half of the generation system may be off for maintenance in the shoulder period because the weather is beautiful for those five days in Washington that we like to call fall. But one of the things, and you know, I think that the other speakers will focus a bit more on the characteristics of generation, but policymakers and regulators and customers all need to keep in mind that we are, as a resource intelligent consumer, realizing that not all kilowatts are created equal, but our bills still treat them often as if they are. Transmission investment carries power between utilities and across distances. How did we get here? It wasn't always like that. Charlie Curtis knows that probably better than anybody. But we realized that not everybody had to build rainy day generation to keep the lights on. We could borrow it from each other, leading to high voltage transmission line between the utilities so that we could lean on our neighbors because that was a cheaper alternative than building up to 115% of peak load every, you know, for every individual system. And our system grew organically, system by system, city by city. We do not have a national grid. We have an interconnected grid that works increasingly as a large integrated machine, or actually three of them, one in the east, one in the west, and one in the sovereign nation of Texas. But it has allowed us to contemplate doing things that we didn't think of, such as moving wind from the Midwest all the way as far as Pittsburgh, or to contemplate bringing hydro down into New England. And this is not what we built it for, but it's increasingly how we want to use it. The distribution side takes us to the system that most of us see most, the wires in our neighborhoods, those same wires and substations most vulnerable to bad weather, and those that result in those horrible bucket trucks that defoliate our neighborhoods. But one thing that I think that we can lose sight of or fail to appreciate or always understand is that the electric system we pay for today was built yesterday. In fact, often many yesterdays ago. While some of the assets are older than 40 years and are no longer carried in active rate base, not all of them are. And the rates that the utilities collect today are to cover the assets they built yesterday. So changes in assumed consumption over the 40-year life of an asset make a big difference. Monopoly service is covered by what we refer to as a regulatory compact. Although much of the electricity industry has been restructured, some use the word deregulated, but I would argue that, um, the utility that brings the power to your door is still a regulated franchised entity, okay? There's assumptions that go into giving that franchise to one company. And that is, there are obligations on both sides. That means that there is a guaranteed rate of return for the investor that makes the investments to bring the service to you. And there are responsibilities of that provider to the customers and to the regulators. But it's important to remember, it goes on both ways. Utilities have an incentive to do better than the rate case estimated. They risk under recovery if they don't. And if you want a good way to explain to your friends what goes on in the electricity business, the best sort of layman's explanation I found was John Friedman's Hot, Flat, and Crowded, who explains how price times quantity is basically how utilities recover their money. So if you can sell more power, if your load grows, if your economy booms, you will make more money as a utility. If it contracts, 
If you don't take care of your system, you will make less. Difficult weather is often followed by quarterly, quarterly earnings that have great upside. But energy efficiency is a difficult thing to manage. If you're looking at new investments, it's an incredible opportunity. Regulators should challenge a utility. Are you operating as efficiently as you could? Is this the best investment? These cases should be tested. But if you're 20 years into a 40-year recovery as a utility operator, I wouldn't want to hear that you'd like to see my, my revenue drop 20%. That doesn't reward me for cutting costs. That doesn't incentivize me to do a better job. It's, it violates that regulatory compact that we've asked for. And I think that Greg's more resource and aware consumer also poses a conundrum for utilities. If we thought 10 years ago we were going to grow at one way and now we're growing at another, that challenges the business model in a way that isn't malicious on the part of the utility or malevolent on the part of customers, but it is a reflection of the world changing. When a utility can't recover consistent with the promises made by the regulators, customers pay for that too. Although those first dollars may disappear out of the utility's profit lines, as that profitability shrinks, that cost of financing goes up, and that finds its way into our bills. And that's something that we need to be aware of when we are asking utilities to walk away from long-lived investments before they're fully recovered. Net metering is a huge conundrum, and I'll leave time to talk more about this. But I would argue it doesn't compensate solar power generation fairly on peak for what it's really providing in the market. But I would also say that I do not see how net metering programs that we have in place today are in any way sustainable over the long term. They do not respect, as Greg alluded to, the fact that we have a grid to maintain that last time I checked, folks on distributed generation who do not have complete on-site storage need the grid the other 20 hours a day their system doesn't produce. And net zero consumption is not off-grid. And this is something that policymakers, I think, are going to increasingly get frustrated with because as these programs grow and solar drops in price, the fact that we have a dumb tariff laying al operating alongside of what we hoped would be a much smaller policy will be a very difficult bill to come due. Can the industry change? Sure it can. When I was in college, I had a long-distance boyfriend. I used to have a $300 phone bill every month. Some of you weren't born then. <laughs> but we used to pay for long distance. <laughs> we used to call after 9 o'clock at night because it was cheaper. And then we got cell phones, and they were so expensive by the minute. Now we don't even charge for cell phone minutes. Now we're charged for data. Yes, industries can change, even industries that have significant upfront infrastructure commitments. But electricity, I'd argue, in some ways is bigger and more costly than telecom. But there is a possibility that we can move forward. There's also other policy tensions, and this is what I'll conclude with. We talk about the opportunities for wind. We talk about the carbon neutrality of nuclear. And those things that policymakers want to maximize are very inconsistent with a growing discussion around distributed generation. You need big transmission lines to bring Midwest wind into population centers. Well, who wants to pay for them if they're sitting on a solar grid? These are things that need to be worked out. We need to look at all of our high-minded goals and see how to line them up in a way that's most effective. And we ideally should do it before the next round of infrastructure deployment. Thanks, Christy. Maybe we'll move on to Miles, who's got the regulator perspective. Why don't you use mine? That's better. We'll fight over it later. It'll yeah, so honestly, giving me the microphone, you guys are like, why didn't they let him just keep using the one that wasn't turned on? Uh, friends, thanks for uh, giving me a few minutes of your time. I'm Miles Keough with NARUG, and um, I'm going to make a little bit of a case for uh, befriending your state regulators, uh, not just because they signed my paychecks, although that probably affects my case somewhat. The electric grid, if you were to try and draw a map of it, 
you'd actually need to draw a series of maps because it's not one thing. So it looks different depending on what angle you're looking at it from. If you're a kilowatt, if you're an electron that's been generated and put out on the grid, the map looks one way. The map of the United States and actually Canada, a little piece of Mexico. It has three big parts, right? The eastern interconnection, kilowatts flow fairly, relatively freely. The western interconnection and, and ERCOT, right? So there's three kind of lines that split up the geography there. If you're a dollar, the map looks different. There are different kinds of markets in which, if you're a dollar, you can move around. There's RTOs, uh, regional transmission organizations, uh, independent system operators. There are non-RTO uh, regions. The wholesale markets, they have a different set of regionally oriented uh, uh, boundaries to them. If you're a decision maker, there are only two sets of lines that matter, right? The map of the United States, the electrical map of the United States in that case, has a federal layer, which looks like the map of the United States, and it has a state layer, which looks like the states in the United States, right? And so you're either a federal regulator or you're a state regulator. Uh, and so jurisdictionally, that is a third map. How many of you guys know what a state public utility commission is? Let me see there. Show of hands. How many of you guys would be able to name one of your state public utility commissioners? Raise your hand. You are nerds, and I love you for it. Thank you. How many of you know how much you pay per kilowatt hour for uh, your electric rate? Nerds. My nerds. Thank you for, for uh, owning up to that. We'll stick together when the, when the, when the uh, bullies show up. Uh, with those three maps, and with all the changes that folks have been talking about that are coming, we're all going to have solar panels. We're all going to decarbonize. We're going to have a nuclear renaissance. We're going to do um, uh, uh, massive investment in gas plants. We're going to do all these things. It's going to cost billions or even trillions of dollars. Wouldn't it be great to have a national energy policy where just one simple big plan to just cover everything, right? We've got all these changes. We'll just come up with a, a national energy plan. We've been waiting for the cavalry to come over the hill with a national energy plan for decades. My assertion is the cavalry ain't coming. We are going to have no one big plan in spite of the fact that change is in fact coming. Change is coming, but it's going to come differently depending on where you are and when you are. There are three maps of the electric system right now. And if you were to diversify it even further and say, what kind of power plants do we have? Or what kind of uh, customers do we have? What kind of rate designs do we have? What kind of market structures do we have? There's even more and more and more maps. Which means that the changes that show up will change different parts of the map differentially. So change will be uneven. And it'll actually be recognizably uneven. It'll show up in different ways based on what region you are and, and by when things show up. Let me spend a moment talking about how the timing and the time scale that you're trying to plan for makes a big difference. Y'all remember back in 2008, 2008, Halcyon days? It was uh, 123 coal-fired power plants in the permitting pipeline. Uh, natural gas was $14 an MMBTU at the Henry Hub. Uh, There's no such thing as an electric car, no such thing as smart grid. Uh, climate change legislation, inevitable. Right? It was like 4,000 installed megawatts of uh, wind energy. Uh, God knows what solar cost back then, right? This is, this, is all, this is all, we knew what was happening back in 2008. Fast forward seven years, everything wrong. You should see the PowerPoint presentations I was delivering seven years ago. They're hilarious. They're awful. They're completely wrong. My assertion is that six, seven years from now, we are going to be as wrong about everything now as we were back in 2008. It changes. Meanwhile, we're trying to make investments in power plants, transmission lines, things like that, which we pay those off with 40-year mortgages. So they have to be making money for 40 years. That's a minimum of a 40-year investment. And we're making those decisions largely through uh, the wisdom of state regulators who are in office an average of three years, right? So we're 
wrong about everything six years out, we're making 40 or plus year decisions um, with regulators who are in office a very short term. I would say this creates a challenge. Um, I believe change is coming. I think, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we basically asked and expected of our utilities, go out there and crush rocks and sell kilowatts. Crush rocks and sell kilowatts. Right? Over time, that's changed. Um, but we certainly are not in the situation where we have very dispatchable generation, very predictable load. Um, we're now in a situation where load wants to act as generation, where you know generation is variable and not dispatchable. It's a hot mess out there. And as we move forward, one of the, the challenges that, that I spend a lot of time on, cybersecurity, not gonna go down that rabbit hole with you guys, but, but fundamentally, this all of a sudden becomes a big deal because as one of the big changes that we're doing with our system is we're integrating data and intelligence into everything we buy from now on. Everything that you buy in the electric grid is no longer gonna be a dumb thing anymore. Everything is gonna have a smart component to it, so everything's got a cybersecurity component to it from now on. Eventually, all this data-enabled stuff is going to change what kind of industry this is. Eventually, the data is gonna start having a ton of value. To whom? I don't know, maybe to customers, maybe to big companies, maybe to Google with its self-driving cars, I don't know. But it's gonna have a lot of value, and maybe even more value than the kilowatt hours themselves that we're selling. Friends, we are in a situation where good decision making is happening under conditions of radical uncertainty. Decision making under conditions of uncertainty, there's a, there's a job that helps you do that. There's a, there's a discipline, it's called risk management. We used to ask the companies to crush rocks and sell kilowatt hours. Now we ask them to be risk managers. Regulators too need to be risk managers. Risk management, when you're trying to make conditions, good decisions under conditions of uncertainty, it has a lot of different strategies you can employ. You can double down and push for maximizing your benefits under the kind of future that you say must be the case. We're gonna all in on a national energy strategy and we're just gonna push on that until it's right. Right? Another strategy is to minimize your regrets. One, six, seven years from now, you are inevitably wrong, right? Uh, there are a bunch of different ways, a lot of different strategies in risk management that you can use. One thing that tends to be a common strategy no matter what you're doing, how many of y'all have a financial portfolio? Raise your hand if you have a financial por portfolio. Yeah, my inner 99%er is eyeing you. We got our eyes on you. Um, in, in financial uh, risk management, diversification is a big deal, right? It's something that, that folks depend on. And rather than putting my own set of pet rocks for diversification means we should build exactly this kind of power plant because I like it, or we should have this kind of tariff because I like it. Instead, I'm gonna suggest maybe a good national energy strategy is to allow for a little bit of diversification in how we make our decisions about our national energy strategy. Let's say, for example, we assemble groups of uh, three to seven uh, really wise decision makers in each of the 50 states and allow them to do some of the decision making about the rates, terms, and conditions of the provision of monopoly utility service. Maybe that should be a pretty good uh, first step in figuring out how we construct a policy that works for the entire country. And if you want to figure out who some good candidates to do that would be, I would commend that you go out and Google your state regulator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miles. Um, and then finally, we'll go to John Larson, who we've asked to, not that we picked any of the illities uh, that Melanie put up earlier, but certainly there is a robust conversation and one that we've engaged with directly with Rhodium Group. Uh, on, on this question of decarbonization and what it means for uh, reliability, affordability, those other issues, and environmental management in general. So we asked John to talk a little bit about those core tensions. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, a lot of folks already have talking about a lot of the issues. I mean, there's a lot of interconnections through all of this. So I'll, I'll focus on basically what decarbonization is and what it means for the power sector and then uh, connect those dots with reliability and affordability. So decarbonization, well, first of all, uh, the electric power sector measures up to about 2 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually right now. That is the single largest 
greenhouse gas emitting sector in the United States. It accounts for about a third of total greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a good reason to talk about decarbonization uh, with, the, uh, with a focus on the power sector. And if you're going to have any chance of solving the climate change problem, and if the U.S. is going to have any chance of playing a leadership role in dealing with that problem, you basically have to deal with electric power and the emissions, or we don't have a chance. So uh, that essentially means you got to get, uh, what that means for decarbonization is you essentially need to shoot for zero emissions at some point in the future, uh, and the sooner the better if you're trying to deal with this. It's solely through, through a dealing with climate change lens. Uh, the good news is that market trends and uh, like lower electricity demand, like cheap natural gas and uh, drastically uh, reduced cost for renewables means we are already reducing our emissions in the power sector considerably. Since 2005, uh, and, and I agree with Miles, we wouldn't have known this in 2008 either, but since 2005, we've had a 15 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the United States from 2005 to 2012. That's translated into an 11 percent reduction in total economy-wide emissions. So you can see that uh, the trends in one sickle sector is already having reverberations uh, in, in dealing with the total problem. And so one could say, hey, great, you know, the market's taking care of everything. But you look at EIA's latest forecast, and who knows if they're right, uh, but um, you know, the gold standard for energy forecast in the U.S., and they, they essentially project emissions to stay flat into the future, but almost flat all the way out to 2040. I looked at the chart again yesterday. It's kind of striking how it's almost a straight line. Uh, so market trends get us part of the way, uh, but there could be a, a strong case for, for additional intervention to deal with, um, to deal with this problem. Um, another reason to deal with decarbonization in the power sector is because once you've got uh, this sector on a pathway to zero, it opens up opportunities for abatement in other sectors of the economy. Uh, you know, people talk about electrification of the vehicle fleet uh, for energy security reasons and any number of other reasons, but if you get uh, electrification of the vehicle fleet and a zero emitting electric sector, you've all of a sudden uh, doubled down on your, on your emission reductions because guess what the second largest sector of emissions in the United States is? It's transportation. Uh, if you can reduce uh, emissions from buildings and industry through, the, through electrification, through a decarbonized grid, you, you go that much further. Uh, and decarbonization doesn't just mean decarbonization of central gen. I think we're seeing the, the predominant trend on the distributed generation side is already zero emitting. So we're, we're, uh, it's interesting to see how that, that trend that has so many other disruptive qualities also has a, a, an attractive climate change benefit. Um, so if we're not going to get there uh, uh, through just the market trends alone, and if you just continued, our, our, it's about a 2% reduction per year right now is where the, tra the path we've been on. If you follow that trend, let's say EI is wrong and the markets are going to get us where we need to go on a similar trajectory to what we've been on, we're still looking at 2100 for full decarbonization of the power sector. So you know, policy is probably required to get us there. Uh, and ideally, that would be a price on carbon, something straightforward, predictable, uh, levels the playing field across all generation options. You just price in carbon and let the market figure it out. Uh, some states have already gone there. We've got California. We've got the uh, northeast states who have uh, prices on carbon in their generation sectors, and, and you are starting to see changes happen uh, from those policy interventions. Wouldn't it be nice if Congress could also pursue that pathway and provide a, a, a uniform federal policy? Uh, this is one area where uh, a federal policy in the energy sector might, might, make, might be quite, quite helpful. Uh, but instead, what we're left with is uh, EPA's Clean Air Act authority, at the moment anyway, under Section 111D. And we'll be uh, expecting EPA's proposal to deal with existing power plants uh, early next month. And uh, as Sarah alluded, Rhodium and CSIS are, are planning to work together to look very closely at that proposal once it's released. Um, so what does policy intervention mean? Well, you know, not knowing what EPA is going to propose and, and knowing that we probably won't have a uniform federal carbon price anytime soon, uh, I will talk in general terms, but policy intervention doesn't mean you have to eliminate fossil fuels tomorrow uh, or anything like that. It does mean that over the long run, we need to figure out what to do with fossil fuel emissions. So uh, that we've talked about cost and investment in, in new generation and, and in the uh, central grid. 
uh, we need to be thinking about what that means for uh, carbon capture and storage in central gen plants uh, to the degree to which they're playing a significant role in the grid in the future. And uh, EPA is already taken a stab at, at, at forcing that technology through uh, its proposed standards on new plants, which actually do require partial carbon capture on, on, ex on new uh, coal plants. But in the meantime, uh, and I would note there's a lot of private sector activity in that space that's leading the way. A southern company has a first-in-class uh, first plant that's uh, going to be uh, probably commissioned next year. Uh, you've got NRG and a few others taking a, a whack at this problem right now. And if they succeed, they're going to be leaders not just in the U.S. but globally in pushing that technology. Uh, but in the meantime, we have a whole host of opportunities and options on the shelf that we can use, many of which are being used for other reasons already, uh, in, in, and many of them have already been named as, as uh, uh, things that are, are changing the, the calculus for the electric power sector. One is energy efficiency. Another is uh, renewable energy, maintaining and, and perhaps expanding our nuclear energy cap, uh, capacity in the United States, either through upgrades or new builds. Um, you can also ha get a considerable amount of emission reductions from shifting dispatch of coal generation to gas generation, uh, very large amounts. And we've already seen some of this through the market trends. Lower gas prices have ultimately been already inducing that kind of change. Uh, so I think uh, stay tuned uh, for next month with what EPA has on offer. Um, it's going to be a tough road to hoe there for them. Uh, I think uh, another thing I'd point to in, in what's kind of interesting about the EPA's approach under the Clean Air Act is uh, it actually relies on the 50 states for implementation of the standards. EPA can only suggest uh, what uh, types of ambition should be required and uh, options for getting there, and the states are ultimately the ones that put together plans and standards to regulate those power plants. So that, uh, that interaction uh, between the federal government and the states is going to be very important to ultimately uh, showing us what, what, we, what the next decade of decarbonization uh, policy is going to look like. I would say one thing, which is so, so it's long, EPA's proposals should be clear to the market about what the intentions are, because otherwise you do have uh, run the risk of some serious stranded asset questions. And uh, I don't think anybody, uh, I mean, that we've kind of heard that all the way along the panel here, and that's a, that's a very real possibility and one that, you know, the only way around it is being, sending clear signals to the market quickly about what the next set of investments should look like uh, within a policy framework. So that's decarbonization. How that connects to reliability. When I think of reliability, I think about Christine's description of kind of, you've got generation, transmission, distri distribution, and reliability is two things to me. One is, do you have enough energy to meet demand, and do you have enough infrastructure to get that energy where it needs to go? And uh, typically, we do a decent job of that uh, uh, on the whole. There's always, you know, the lights on, you know, don't stay on all the time, but uh, much better than some countries. Um, and right now, with a lot of the changes that have already been mentioned, I'll just mention another one, which is... Uh, you know, through other EPA regulations and the market trends I mentioned before, we've already started to see a pretty dramatic uh, move in the form of retirements of, of coal capacity in the United States. And some of these plants have been around for 50 years or longer. You've literally built the grid around them to make uh, the grid work, and now you're taking them out of the picture. 2012, we saw unprecedented number of uh, capacity retirements in the coal, coal sector, uh, over 10 gigawatts got retired. We have for 2015, when the mercury air toxic standard comes into full compliance, 2015-2016, um, we have at least 20 gigawatts more planned retirements for that year. Uh, EIA projects up to 45 gigawatts of retirements by 2016. So far, the good news is our institutions have been serving as well. You know, the, the RTOs, the PUCs, the, the utilities themselves have been managing that transition quite well and the lights are staying on. Uh, how that uh, those institutions work going forward when you start to put more pressure on central generation uh, in, in from a reliability perspective is going to be very important. Um, one thing I'll note uh, with regards to, to 111D, the EPA rules that are coming up on greenhouse gases, is that two things ultimately are going to matter for reliability. One is timing and flexibility. To the degree to which you have a long and well, well-defined timeline for implementation of those uh, greenhouse gas standards, that gives the market plenty of time to figure out uh, what should be retired or built and when, and it gives regulators plenty of time to figure out how to manage the grid around that. 
The other is flexibility. One thing, uh, the MAT standard that's getting implemented now is, is very inflexible. You either meet the standard or you don't. If you don't meet the standard by 2016, you have to shut off. Uh, 111D is not, I don't expect it to look like that. I think you're actually going to have opportunities where if you have a, a unit, uh, a generating unit that uh, can find other ways to stay around either through capacity markets or through even reliability most run orders from an RTO or something like that, uh, they can buy compliance credits or uh, make a deal with the, the state and the state implementation plan to stick around and maintain reliability and still the state can meet its overall emission reduction goals. So that flexibility has to be hard-coded and clearly defined in the EPA proposal so that uh, regulators can, can manage that. But that's ultimately a key component to look for uh, with regard to reliability. Um, in the long term, looking beyond just this EPA proposal, we've got other things to deal with with the decarbonization. One is greater in, uh, interconnection of variable resources. Uh, some people say, and DOE did a study on this, that, you know, well, you can get to 80 percent wind by 2050 or 80% renewables. Well, that requires some technologies that are not commercially deployed yet to get there. And, uh, and it may require regulatory uh, actions and, and frameworks that don't exist yet to get there. Um, may, and so that's, that's one thing to think about. Another is the, uh, something Melanie talked about a lot, which is the interne interconnection of natural gas and electricity infrastructure. Getting the gas where you need it to run your gas combined cycle plants when you want them to run um, and at the levels you need them to run at. Uh, it's just, it's a lot different than having a big pile of coal outside. You can just shovel more in and keep the coal, coal plant running. You need to have gas on demand real time. Um, so that's another key component. Meanwhile, you've got the resiliency issue. You've got heat waves, you've got uh, increased um, extreme weather. All of this is going to get harder and more challenging under climate change. Uh, you've got cyber threats, and I won't go into that rabbit hole either, but all of those things um, are additional challenges beyond uh, uh, dealing with decarbonization. So you've got to uh, be ready to plan around a lot of those things. And I think that opens up discussions not just around carbon policy, but around energy, uh, electricity regulation and policy. Uh, you know, we, we had an earlier conversation uh, before the panel about uh, capacity mar markets. And if you have uh, energy markets and or capacity markets that value uh, these generators, not just for energy, but for all the other resources they provide to the grid, including reliability and stability, uh, you can um, really, I think, help maintain uh, reliability in ways that we just currently can't. And what I mean by that, for example, is again, you might have a coal plant that on its own, from an energy market perspective, doesn't, doesn't, isn't profitable under, under say, a 111D framework, right, because it's, it's carbon intensive. But if it rants, the climate only cares about the emissions, not about the fuel, right? So if you have that coal plant online for hot days only, um, and you pay for it um, as such through capacity payments, you still get a very large emission reduction. So if you're only running that coal plant 20% of the time instead of 85% of the time. And you can still maintain reliability because you, need, you have it there when you really need it. So there are, um, if you have energy markets that value that, uh, you, you, your reliability problems are much more manageable under a, under a carbon constraint, at least in the near to medium term. Ultimately, we get to deal with those, those emissions from those plants, but it, but it matters. Um, Switching over to uh, affordability just briefly, uh, I'll talk about a different complementary policy again, which is energy efficiency. The energy efficiency helps affordability in two major ways. One is the lower your demand uh, is, the less you have to build, which means the less you have to finance and the less the ratepayers have to pay for it. They still have to pay for efficiency. So if, if you still, that's under the assumption that the efficiency you're doing is cost effective. But so long as that's the case, you are uh, reducing the overall infrastructure investment you need in the power sector to, to decarbonize. So um, that's one way energy efficiency policies, both federal and state, can be useful. The other is from the consumer perspective. The lower a customer's bill is, the less exposure they have to additional costs uh, from carbon policy itself. So if you did have, say, a carbon price and that raises electric rates, but you're using less electricity because you're more efficient, you're going to have less of a hit on your, on your overall expenditures um, from that increase in costs from paying for carbon. Uh, and there's a whole host of economic literature out there from folks down the street at RFF and elsewhere around how you can use carbon policy uh, to redirect revenues from a carbon price, for example, to mitigate uh, rate impacts on the least, uh, on those that can least afford it. And so there's a whole other discussion you can have about how you design the policy in the first place to mitigate impacts to uh, both low-income customers 
uh, trade exposed, industrial customers, a uh, variety of different folks that might have a serious issue with, with substantially higher electric rates under, in a decarbonized world. So those are, uh, policy doesn't solve all, especially when you don't have an omniscient federal government or, or state PUCs uh, that could handle all these questions, but there are a lot of ideas and, and uh, options out there for managing these things into the future. So, so thanks. Thanks, John. We've got a fair bit of time for discussion, but what I thought I would like to do is maybe ask, uh, push back a little bit on the panelists to, to sort of tease out some of the core issues that we've been thinking about um, within the context of what you've said. And I encourage you guys to uh, chime in on each other and and, uh, and follow up with other questions if you have them. But, but one of them, Christy, maybe starting with you, and I think we've heard a bit of this from, from just about everybody on the panel, but there are sort of two overarching notions about what is changing or might need to change here, right? One is certainly about market structure, and the other is this idea of the regulatory compact, right? I mean, so given the challenges that are out there and the, the way that they're challenging people who are investing and people who are regulating the industry, are we talking about something that can fundamentally be dealt with with some, some temporary or innovative or more flexible sort of market structure questions? Or is it really the, this sort of regulatory compact question in and of itself that is at the core of what we're deciding these days, right? Is it, is it about whether or not electricity and the service that it is and has been has that, you know, looks, you know, uh, has less of sort of a strategic bent um, uh, than, than what it always has, right? Sort of less of that justifiable sort of monopolistic um, uh, uh, public good aspect to it. Has anything changed about that, or is this really just about a market structure that has to adapt to new capabilities and new trends, but that social compact piece is sort of still there? Um, the way I see it, I think that what, we, what we've observed is that um, there is still a political insistence on the benefits of a regulatory compact but there is a political demand to have an iPhone-enabled, I-can-do-whatever-I-want consumer environment. And those are two very difficult things to reconcile. Um, and that's, that's one level of it. The other level is, is we want the market to solve the problem, but we actually don't want the market to operate because we can't stand volatility. Um, you're not allowed to turn anybody off. Um, you're not allowed to stop delivering service, except for in very narrow circumstances, and you're not allowed to let prices go to $1,000 a megawatt hour and actually show scarcity. Um, the markets we have are markets only because they're called that. So I think what we have is, Charlie's laughing, and, <laughs> and he, knows I <laughs> he knows I speak truth. <laughs> it's, it's a very difficult situation because there's a lot of things we want, um, but I think we've done ourselves a poor service in remembering how we account for them. Um, while it may be a really good idea from a policy perspective to incrementally move towards a more distributed grid, um, there is likely to be a demand to still have a certain amount of interconnectivity at the high voltage level because it gives us additional resources. What does that look like? How do we phase out those resources? How do we phase down those costs? And so an accounting for achieving our dream, I think, is the part of the discussion that we're missing. Even Friedman's book, which I loved in a lot of ways because it reduced in an intelligible way for my dad what I do all day, he completely finessed the cost issue. You know, there was really no linkage for how you get there from here. How do you say, okay, We've got a 35-year-old power plant that six years ago, no, six, three years ago, we spent a lot of money to upgrade. So it's not fully depreciated on either the environmental or the rate base, but we're going to kill it next year because it's uneconomic. And even if it could comply with MATS because it's coal-fired and we probably won't have it survive under the GHG and SPS. There's a cost to that. There's a cost to transitioning the opportunities we want to have with allowing customers to put solar on their roof at $120 a megawatt hour, and benefit from it when it is producing, but not pay them $120 a megawatt hour when we should be serving them with $30 power. So it's working those things out. And we've talked a lot, I think, in policy circles about big pictures and ideas and what we can do, but we haven't taken the steps to say, okay, if we chose this scenario, 
How do we pay for it? Yeah, I get to? Yeah. Sweet. Okay, so um, the regulatory compact gets a bum rap. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it says companies, you get a monopoly. No one, the economics work is such that you are able to build a huge power plant and run a bunch of transmission lines, and, and ain't anybody really going to come in as another company and compete with you. Because it just makes more sense to have one company build one set of infrastructure rather than running two sets of power lines to everybody's house, right? So the regulatory compact, however, and it basically says you will get cost recovery for prudently incurred expenses serving that monopoly. It doesn't guarantee anything about the future. It talks about cost recovery. Usually there's exceptions. There's construction work in progress and pre-approval for certain kinds of blah, blah, blah. There's nuances, but fundamentally the the regulatory compact says you got to deliver the most reliable, most affordable service, and in return, we'll set your rates such that this isn't going to be a great business to be in. This isn't going to be, you know, um, Facebook, <laughs> but but it'll be a good business to be in, and your shareholders will will have a lot of their risks managed. Um, I think as we talk about this balance between what is set by regulators and what is set by the market, people seem to see this as it's an either or proposition. I think in fact that, uh, like they say in politics, money is speech, money is communication, right? So it's okay that we communicate about different things using different mechanisms. Using a market structure is very good at communicating near-term activity. We really want you to do something within a two-year time frame, so we're putting a price on it. Companies, go get it, right? We want you to dispatch your power plants in a certain order, so we're having a spot market. Uh, show up and put your plants in the bid stack and run them today, right? Markets are really good at communicating short-term uh, messages and, and communicating short-term policy priorities. They're not as good, or at least unless they're very sophisticated, they're not as good at communicating longer term messages. So I'm a little uncomfortable taking a, putting my flag in the ground over the arguments over whether capacity markets are working or not. Okay. But basically, yeah, <laughs> Christy and me are gonna, we're gonna have a beer later about it, I'm sure. But, but fundamentally, I would say that those who criticize capacity markets are saying that the price that you got to pay to communicate that longer term signal of this is a good investment, build a power plant. You want to keep your power plant online. Um, that those market mechanisms may be, those strictly market mechanisms, may be uh, less well nuanced than they need to be to communicate a longer term signal that keeps these plants in the game. And so for that kind of longer term thinking, you want a different you maybe want a different tool than an immediate price signal. You want something that relies on a plan. You want something that builds out of uh, something that a regulator is going to sit there and say, if this is a prudently incurred expense that delivers reliable and affordable power, you're going to get your money for it. You know? That's why you need a regulator. And I think it's OK that we have both. Um, I think we can do better, but I don't think that, that fundamentally that's a broken system. The last thing I'll say is that one of the real tensions that we have in terms of a change that's caused by disruptive technologies or a change that's caused by um, uh, 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 a change in how we provide power to customers or they provide power to themselves uh, is the same problem that we see when you lose power in a big thunderstorm for a few <laughs> days. It's the same problem. The problem is we're getting a hell of a deal for electricity. We pay much less for electricity than a strict supply demand valuation would deliver to you, right? Electricity is worth a lot more than we pay for it. And if you don't believe me, try losing power for two weeks and see if you would still pay 8.7 cents a kilowatt hour for that kilowatt hour that's delivered after two weeks of no power, or if after a couple weeks you pay a little bit more. My guess is, we keep the price uh, lower than it's, it hasn't been there for two weeks 
value. And the way we've done that is 120 years of cost of service regulation that even if you've restructured your market still has important ramifications for getting you power for a hell of a deal. So when we start messing around with how do we incentivize the appropriate kind of changes in our system, it's not that we should or shouldn't give up this hell of a deal price that we've got on electricity. It's just we should be mindful of the fact that we're, we're really, we're getting a real great deal here. I, I just a you know just a couple of um, of comments to kind of add on that we've we've alluded to I think to this earlier uh, and I think if you look back you have to acknowledge that this, the regulatory complex that, that we've had has worked exceedingly well in this country for many many years because we have had for the most part very safe very reliable and very affordable electricity um, I think it's worked it, so it's worked very well. You know, we're entering into um, this era, I think, of, of uncertainty that we've been talking about um, in quite a few different ways. We've talked about, you know, the, the, the concept of putting, you know, of build, investing for in something that's got a 40-year life, uh, for example. We've all refused to go down the uh, cyber security, you know, uh, rat hole or rabbit hole or, or, or whatever. Um, but I think, and I think it was Miles that alluded to this, I think a, a kind of a paradigm shift that has to be there in thinking is things have to start to be taught of in terms of risk. And what are you willing to pay to avoid something from happening? And I don't think we heretofore have had to do that because the system has been safe, affordable, and reliable. And every time you put money into it to con make it that way, continue to be that way, you sold more kilowatt hours because demand was constantly growing across the U.S. And so you didn't, you weren't in a situation where you were making an investment much more like an insurance policy. And I think we're moving more and more in that direction. So I think as we start to look at some of these questions we're asking, you know, about how much something should cost, how much should we should pay for it, whether we should do this, you have to start to look at some of these things more from a risk avoidance and the cost that's associated with that, and then the appropriate compensation for whoever's writing that insurance policy. John, did you want to add oh, go ahead. One of the other things that, uh, Miles, you sort of talked about very directly, but is also a huge part of the tension of why people and policymakers and people with policy priorities and abilities and prerogatives uh, oftentimes make this a much less direct and simplified conversation than it otherwise could be is this sort of federal state divide piece, right? Obviously there are priorities that come from sort of a, a federal nationwide sort of level and there's other things that, that can be and are managed on sort of your different maps as you talked about. Um, well, John laid out, you know, uh, what is arguably a, a national priority, right? Decarbonization, but it is playing out in lots of different ways all across the country, right? Is there something about that sort of federal state divide that that when you look at some of the challenges that we see that we're facing and they are so sort of regionally different, does that mean that there is fundamentally less role for federally coordinated policy prerogatives? Does this mean that, um, and, and does that necessarily yield universally better outcomes, or is there a problem in that vision as well, right? So if you have a multitude of different approaches to things, does that sort of yield problems that have to get worked out at a federal level as well? Is there something that fundamentally has to sort of change in that, in sort of the divide between that relationship? No. Uh, you know, one of the things that I get to do is, I get to uh, uh, take the mic with smart folks like you, uh, but one of the other things that I get to do is I talk to foreign delegations when they come to the United States and they say, explain to us how the power sector in the United States works. And you know, we'll have folks from Mexico or Malaysia where they have one regulator, one grid, one real power company. And we'll, you know, I'll explain to them, you know, we have the, these different maps and there's 50 states and the PUCs are setting the distribution rates and we've got you know, some places where we're paying a nickel for power and some places where we're paying 40 cents for power and 
all this uh, uh, decision making that's disaggregated and these public processes where everyone gets to come in and argue over the setting of rates and every hat and every truck and every you know inch of copper wire, et cetera. And I get done with it. And generally, I would say that the expressions on the faces of the visitors are somewhere between disbelief and kind of, you got to be kidding. Like, why would you do it that way? Why would you set up a system that's such a complex mousetrap Rube Goldberg device of policy making? And the answer is because it works, right? It works. We have reliable and affordable power. And we also have, um, we have some goals that we have in common that, or that, or that we steer towards in common that are national goals. So for example, um, a, kilo, uh, an, a molecule of carbon dioxide that is gonna go up and do whatever it's gonna do to the climate does not care if it's emitted in Georgia or if it's emitted in Hawaii, or for that matter, Rwanda. Um, addressing those kinds of national policy questions, international policy questions, setting those kinds of goals, uh, I think it's outside the scope of Georgia's authority to set that for the other 49 states in the District of Columbia. I think if we're going to set a goal like that, that's, if, if that's what the country's going to do, that's something that's a federal responsibility. And the federal responsibility will say, we are all ending up over here in this town, you know, in this location. And we don't care if you get there in a car or plane or train if you walk, if you hitchhike, if you go north or south, but we're all in and up here and get there how you will. And I think that that's an appropriate uh, role for a federal uh, decision-making authority. But I also think that in the case of decarbonization, we see Georgia's decarbonizing faster in the last few years than most of the Kyoto signatory countries. We're seeing them making big investments in things like nuclear power plants. We're seeing South Carolina doubling down on you know, the summer plant and Georgia in, in Vogel. We're seeing Mississippi putting money behind the Kemper IGCC. We're seeing the only uh, long-term CCS rig that's been hooked up to a pulverized coal plant was done at the Mountaineer unit in West Virginia. There are lots of energy efficiency investments and solar investments being made in states like Virginia and in other states which don't uh, spring to mind at cocktail parties in Berkeley and Cambridge <laughs> as the leaders in decarbonization. I don't think that matters. I don't think we all need to be trendy. I think that the, the end goal that's set by the feds can be met by different states and different approaches. Um, so I think it's natural that there's tension. I think that's good that there's fighting. I think that there's a marketplace of ideas and we should let it work. Um, I don't think that the system that we have, complex as it is, is broken. I think that the other thing we're observing increasingly as we navigate these sort of um, federal versus state tensions is the sort of organic development of regional collaboration. I mean, regional differences was a Nehruk term that is now part of any lexicon in the energy space. And I remember when it was fighting words in standard market design. And I think that that is, we are going to continue to see that. I think you're going to see perhaps, you know, an orientation in the Pacific Northwest that's not going to change when it comes to priorities on um, carbon reductions and what they think their carbon profile per megawatt hour should be. And I think the Northeast will continue to be different than the Southeast and the Midwest. But as Miles alluded, that doesn't mean we won't get there. And I think that the regional nature of electricity markets, for good or for ill, also lends itself to that efficiency that first started when utilities realized it was more efficient to lean on their neighbors than it was to build up to the reserve margin every time. And I think that that is going to be something that we're going to continue to see is actually this informal, less structured, less statutory statutorily prescribed collaboration between states, whether it's through RTOs, whether it's through REGI. Um, but when you can find a critical mass of like-minded policymakers setting a direction together, I think that's where you're going to see the action take place, particularly if we continue to live in a city where there is not 60 votes to agree that today is Thursday. Let me just add one quick comment, and, and that is um, on, this, on this question or subject of, you know, 
what should, where should the federal government, you know, be establishing policy? You know, I've, I've heard over and over again and, uh, from my, uh, uh, my colleagues across the uh, electricity sector that the most important thing that they could have is certainty. Okay, and, and, that, and that certainty allows them then to go out and figure out how, how to maximize the opportunities that are out there or, or minimize the, the challenges that it might create in their business. Um, and so I think where, where federal legislation can, pro can provide that type of certainty and also can help deal with the thing that we've been talking about here earlier, and that is today these investments that people are making still have 40-year lives, and should they or should they not be making them, um, I think there can be a benefit, a significant benefit. Um, several years ago, I did a paper at the World Resources Institute that looked at uh, what we called policy innovation and diffusion from the states to the federal level, and we looked at all sorts of different policy issues, not just energy and environment, but even social policy, uh, we looked at welfare reform, we looked at gun control, and just looked at the role of states in trying new things and devising new ways of solving problems that ultimately diffuse vertically up to the federal government, and the federal government set some sort of floor for all states to follow in the long run. And I think when it comes not just to decarbonization, but a lot of the challenges we've talked about today, uh, having the 50 state innovation option out there is, is one way to find solutions faster. Doesn't mean they get adopted widespread in the ways that we might want to see them adopted quickly, but at least you have more ideas on the table. Um, it gets back to an earlier point Miles made about diversification. Uh, he, I think he was talking about the context of, of fuels and uh, options in the power sector, but I mean, having a diverse set of actors coming at these problems with different circumstances uh, should generate a lot of different ideas that we can use to uh, solve a lot of these challenges. I mean, we, 20 years ago, we didn't have RPSs. Now it's a, a renewable portfolio standards. Now they're, they're a common uh, part of the lexicon, but it's still just a state policy. It's still, and that hasn't come up to the federal government yet. Um, and I think we're gonna see that, uh, we've already seen that in carbon policy. We're going to see it uh, in, in spades after 111D comes out if it, if it stands up because you know you have to have, every state has to do something and they can do whatever they need to do to meet the EPA rules. So I think, uh, I think there's a lot of value to that. Now, one thing you also get is the patchwork, right? So you get all these different policies doing all different things to the same end. And uh, if I'm in the business community, I probably do want certainty or one set of rules to operate uh, in, in this country. Now, first of all, that's a very, in almost any aspect of any type of policy landscape for any kind of issue, business rarely has that kind of uh, uniform certainty, but it's a nice thing to shoot for. And so, you know, ultimately, at least on the decarbonization side, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a patchwork of approaches ultimately does catalyze a, a new federal congressional discussion on the issue. Uh, I, I would hope that would be the case. I think ultimately to, to solve this problem from an economy-wide perspective, you need that kind of approach. So. Um, so, but in the meantime, we've got 50 different ones. I wanted to just make two points on certainty. Um, I don't think there's anyone who's active in a business um, who actually expects to be able to foretell the future or expects that there would be a policy contrived, let alone at a national level, that does that. It's not necessarily the specificity of a particular rule. It is bracketing the range of outcomes so that you can get back to a sane risk management discussion, which Miles alluded to earlier. It's not so much whether, what the number is going to be on carbon reductions as much as what are the parameters under which you're going to let me phase out the investments I've made or reimburse me for the ones that you want me to walk away from? What is going to be the litmus test for what's prudent? Those are the things that are critical to not changing. That's the part of the regulatory compact where there needs to be certainty. If we get a decision under 316B that says thou shalt, not, thou shalt eliminate all ones through cooling systems, which is not our call, by the way. We don't think that's going to happen. But some states may elect to do it anyway. Well, what's the parameter under which you're going to help me maintain my nuclear plant now that you've asked me to do a billion dollars worth of plumbing? OK, do you want the plant? Do you want the carbon-free electricity? Okay, the bill is a, is a billion dollars. How do you want to recover it? You want to recover it in five years? You want to recover it in 40? 
Those are the conversations that are this, that's the certainty investors need. It doesn't need to be how many, you know, pounds per megawatt hour by date certain, you know, it, it's, it's what's going to be the terms of the deal. And I think that's where we lose perspective. People talk about certainty and they think, well, I need to know what the rule looks like and I need to know what every provision is. No, I need to know what, how to define my risk, how to qualify my decisions, how to rank them. That's what I think that the business community in the energy space is acting, asking for, particularly when it comes to electricity, whether it's an electric utility or whether or not it's a solar company trying to enter the market. They want to know the rules of engagement. They want to know the shape of the proverbial football pitch. They want to know how long the periods are, who's the ref, and what the rules are. One more sort of uh, streamline of questions, and then, and then we'll open up for the audience for their discussion. One of the things I'm curious about is low-hanging fruit, right? We're in Washington, so we like to wring our hands about a whole bunch of different things. And, and sometimes, sometimes the wringing of the hands is that we need to do something, and sometimes the wringing of the hands is, please, God, don't let anybody do anything about this because they're going to mess it up. <laughs> and then there's the issue of, gee, everybody seems to agree on the importance or the preeminence of a certain issue, and yet we're still wrapped around a pole about it. So from your perspectives, and I, I, you know, not to say that cybersecurity is, inter is an easy issue in any way, shape, or form, but we've all alluded to the fact that everybody understands that it's a major priority, and yet I'm not entirely sure that we've you know, nipped that issue in the bud, so to speak, and we've certainly had some big engagements over uh, how to resolve some of that. What is the low-hanging fruit? What are things that you think will require some action that will get addressed? And what are major areas where, where w there's a little bit more heat than there is light about some of the concern over particular issues that, that you generally feel the system the way it is will pretty much find resolution to over a period of time and, and we're worrying sort of unnecessarily? Well, I think you hit on one of them, and that is reliability standards. I mean, you know, now we're, we're talking national security with the interconnected nature of our system, and I think you've got to have minimum standards that you expect everyone to adhere to, and if, uh, you know, a particular regulator wants even higher standards, then that's fine, but there, I think the reliability standards is one of those areas. If you're contemplating the 101st revision to your capacity market, maybe you should be looking back at your energy price formation in the daily markets for the problem. I almost hate this term because it was used in a not nice way to a colleague of mine, but there are some existential threats out there to the economy that come in by way of the electric system. It's a little more, you know, it's easy to agree that that uh, solid reliability standards are a great idea. I think there's a lot of nuance to how you actually accomplish that and how you demonstrate that you've accomplished that in a way that's really meaningful and useful. But I will say that there are some things that uh, that are things we've been talking about for a long time, and some things that we have not been talking that much about, thank God, that are, um, again, existential threats uh, that pose risks of long-term widespread outages and putting ourselves in a position to, to manage those kinds of really significant threats, acknowledging that they're there and really backing the, the solutions to those. I think that, that those are things we can, um, we can unpile, you know, the pile of pet rocks that gets piled up on everybody's idea about what we should all be doing. Um, I think that's probably one of the few places where we can all agree on. I mean, I think in spite of the fact that we have all these renewable portfolio standards out there in the country, point me to the nearest national renewable energy standard. In spite of the fact that, uh, you know, plenty of the country is doing stuff on energy efficiency, point me to the nearest federal energy efficiency standard. I mean, we have a hard time agreeing on some stuff that, that, um, that seems very common sense. But the one thing that I think, uh, uh, we're more motivated by fear than we are by, uh, by opportunity, and there's some stuff that we should be afraid of, and we should take those risks off the table. Uh, a bit of a, a potentially wonkier answer is, um, you know, everybody says, oh, energy efficiency is, is 
low-hanging fruit, both from a cost perspective and from a political perspective. Everybody loves it for some reason or another, uh, yet sen the Senate still can't get to a vote on, on a very modest bill. Um, but putting that uh, particular legislative effort aside, uh, even at the state level, you have a vast array of diversity in implementation of these types of policies, and sometimes that's a bad thing from a comparability perspective. You don't always, a megawatt hour saved in, in Massachusetts looks very different than a megawatt hour saved in, in Georgia or California. And, uh, and so you can't even compare state policies against each other. Uh, you don't know who's better because, you, because of uh, the very fundamental uh, comparability issues. So uh, a place where the federal government could certainly play a role uh, is, is setting kind of basic, simple, uh, comparable uh, sets of guidance on energy efficiency policy uh, so that uh, people can start to get closer. It's, this is very complicated. I won't get into it. But, it, you know, people can start to get closer to saying, well, if I say I'm going to save X number of megawatt hours by this year, it means the same thing as this other state setting a similar goal. And people can compare and learn from each other. I think you'd actually have a greater diffusion, probably a lower cost to energy efficiency deployment if you had more comparability in those standards. We've got a few minutes left for questions. Um, please just wait for the microphone, state your name and affiliation, and then ask your question in the form of a question. We'll start right here, and then we'll move over to this side, okay? And actually, you know, we only have about 10 minutes left, so why don't I just take all three of the questions, and then we'll, uh, we'll group them together. Hi, I'm uh, David Hunter with the Electric Power Research Institute. Um, and Christine had spoken about uh, the value of electrons, the value of power, having different values, whether it's in the middle of the night when there's an excess power or, or whether it's occurring at peak, and yet it's all price at the same time. I'm wondering if Miles in the, the laboratories of democracy, the 50 uh, different groups of very bright state regulators have come up with any particular ideas um, either you know, being tried out or, or that you think are worth highlighting um, for residential consumers to be able to uh, distinguish between those cheap electrons and those expensive electrons occurring at different times of the day? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sarah. John McCormick with the Institute for Multi-Track Diplomacy. Um, I want to focus on California's uh, electric grid for a second. In 2013, 60% of the uh, megawatt hours were generated from gas-fired capacity. In a state whose population is increasing, the recent uh, national climate assessment gave some dire predictions about water availability, um, perhaps even much higher temperatures. Uh, the difficulty of even citing uh, large wind and solar in California because of all the regulatory hoops. So the question I ask is, what options does California have as a hedge against natural gas price spikes or even availability for price spikes in, in perhaps the very near future? Yes, Jose Colucci, retired professor of chemical engineering, and this one is for you mainly. Uh, in your study that you did with businesses on their perspective of cost of electricity, I was surprised because I dealt a lot with chemical companies and pharmaceuticals and uh, medical products. And in the last decade, maybe it disappeared like everything that you said had disappeared. They even had in their mission and vision the sustainability of the world, the future, and all this other good stuff to the point that even some of them would basically do sustainable or renewable energy projects with four-year payback versus your typical half-year, one-year for energy efficiency because that's their mission. Uh, I was surprised that didn't come up when they look at the cost structure that they didn't even consider the fact that you know we're here for the long run and sustainability should be included in our business analysis. Good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Segero. I'm the president of uh, a non-profit and a profit company. Uh, my question is to Miles. Uh, you talked about uh, people who come from international and from Kenya, and I focus on rural electrification in Kenya. Looking at the policies of uh, the United States and comparing those of Africa, do you think one day it will be international policy for electricity? And the other question is, how, what is the best uh, renewables for uh, for America to import from China, from Africa, and how would it work, and what would be the policies? Thank. Yeah, I'll take a 
shot at that California one. Um, I do know what a duck curve is. I know what the camel is, too. And that's exactly the problem that California faces. California has, gro has a growing capacity for creating, uh, for generating renewable power in the middle of the day or at night. And what it's starting to do is create a dis uh, generation curve that is not, that does not track very well with the demand curve. And you get wind dropping off in the morning just as everybody gets out of bed. You have solar dropping off just as everybody gets home from work. How do you get around that? There are ways to get around that, and I expect that we're going to see those. One of those is going to be when the California ISO starts saying, okay, we're not going to sell 6 by 16 blocks anymore. It doesn't make sense to, offer, to procure natural gas fire generation six, for six days for 16 hours, because we're not using it that way. We are likely going to see different types of power provisioning, and one easy way to do that, because you do have the capability with natural gas plants to run them on shorter intervals. There are cost implications. It's cheaper to run it for 16 hours, okay? But if you really are hell-bent on dispatching that renewable power, you can use that incredibly large gas fleet to manage it. You have to accept, as policymakers, the average cost you wind up with and make everybody whole. The good news is in California, a lot of the state has the lowest consumption per capita in the nation. So there's a certain amount of ability to ingest that. Um, depending on which part of the state. Some of it's very, very low. So the incremental cost on the bill can probably be managed. But I think that's one of the ways they get there because you look at the 6 by 16 dispatch curve, that's insane. But if you say, okay, now I want to tell the utilities that they should be buying power in seven, you know, maybe it's seven by eights, but the eights are split and it's four in the morning and four in the evening. You're going to change the products in the market. You're going to change how you maximize your fleet. You're going to change your dispatch. So far, we've seen the dispatch go from, the, from what plants we're using. We're changing the dispatch on our fuel from coal to gas. Now the question will be, if you have a very renewable intensive portfolio, now you're going to change when you dispatch the gas. That's my hope for California. I don't want to live through a second California power crisis. My t-shirt from the first one still fits. Thank you. <laughs> I'm dying to answer the question of the young lady from, from Kenya, uh, uh, and I think probably it's a long enough answer that what I'll do is give you my card afterwards and we'll talk afterwards. Mm -hmm. David, your question about time of use pricing is too juicy to pass on, though. Mm -hmm. Is there stuff out there that is um, uh, worth highlighting as far as variation in pricing? And I love time of use pricing, and I love inclining block rates, and I love... Um, uh, uh, smart tariff design, um, and I'm going to instead uh, be a jerk and be provocative. I read something this morning uh, that there are utilities in a state that will go unnamed um, that are giving away power for free at night. The time of use pricing setup is use all the power you want at night uh, and pay a differential rate for your daytime consumption that's variable. So um, if you are a committed uh, 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 polar bear hugger, <laughs> as I am. Um, you have to wonder what are the power plants that are running in the dead of night. As it turns out, it happens to be a state that has abundant, bountiful, wonderful wind energy resources. But that doesn't mean that they're not running their baseload coal units all night and dumping the power off and collecting uh, uh, PTC revenues or other kinds of revenues off of their wind units to offset the, the fact that they're dumping carbon emitting power in the dead of night. And I just think that there can be unintended consequences even <clears throat> with the best intended TOU rate designs or variable differentiating rate designs. Um, and that it's worth understanding what you're getting as you design them. That even time of use rates, even different kinds of, of uh, variation in rate design, um, you gotta know what you're doing. This stuff isn't for amateurs. So I will answer your question very quickly. As I said earlier, we've done the study over four years, and we put this in one of the reports a couple of years ago. We used the tagline, green trumps green. Mm. And what that really meant was dollars trump sustainability. So most companies in the U.S., and that's not outside the U.S., it's very different. But in the U.S., most companies that have strong sustainability programs have strong energy management programs, but 
they see the benefits of their sustainability programs as being a byproduct of their energy management programs. The energy management comes first, it kind of motivates because of the bottom line savings, and then they take, they take appropriate credit for it in their sustainability reports. Well, listen, we uh, tend to try and end these things on time so that people will come back, but we're really, really pleased to have had all of you here for this uh, first session that we'll be having. We're going to be coming out with announcements about what the next session will be, probably along the June-July time frame, um, and we hope that this is sort of the beginning of a bigger conversation that we can have. So I just I want to thank everyone for being here today, but also my colleagues Charlie Curtis and Michelle Melton, who were sort of indispensable in putting it together. But mostly thank you, all of you, for spending your afternoon with us. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.